Now, very importantly, when we're doing a shamanic journey, we must have an intention. So an intention to the lower world would be something like, I'm going on a journey to the lower world to meet my paranormal, to ask for help and healing with my boss at work, with the difficulty in my relationship. I'm, I'm feeling disempowered by it, because this is a, a journey of reconnecting to our power. And when we talk about power in a shamanic sense, we're talking about the power of nature, the power of the universe, and then they give you guidance. Now, the guidance can come in different ways. Sometimes it take you on an overview of your problem and show you different aspects of your life that you're not dealing with, you're not um, looking at more closely, that you're missing. That would be like what an eagle might show you. Some of you are quite visual, and so you see very clearly in the shamanic realms. Others of you are more kinesthetic, and my clients come here, they, they feel it in the physical bodies, they feel energy moving, they feel vibrations, they feel um, pins and needles. And some people are clairaudient, they hear um, the messages from spirit, um, while others are quite cerebral, so they think about it in a different way. And I always say to people, don't try to be one thing or another. Be yourself. Whatever way you get the message, whatever, it's basically you're opening yourself to knowledge and information that you haven't access to already at the moment. You may have a sense of it. It may be coming in your dreams. But the shamanic way is a conscious, lucid way of connecting to that knowledge and information. And then bring it in. Then you journal it, draw a mandala about it, but you embody it into your life. So it's a kind of waking dreaming. But the difference is, you're doing it with intention and you're doing it with a purpose and you're doing it, you're shifting your conscious state into a non-ordinary non state. So that's the lower work. And we talk more about that as time goes on. Old age is a very important time in our lives because, and it's very much sort of denigrated in our culture, we can tend to lock our old people away. Whereas in shamanic indigenous cultures, the elders were seen as the wise ones, the ones who needed uh, to be there to inform the rest of the tribe or the, or the community of information that they had learned through their life experiences. Nowadays, people have a lot of information, but they don't have a lot of wisdom. Wisdom comes with age. You may have all the information in the world. You can Google this, Google that, Google the other, but you cannot Google wisdom. Because wisdom is a felt lived experience. And that's what your older self can give you. That's what you can get from that old man or that old woman in the future. And we will show you how to take a journey in the middle world to your future self to be able to find out the wisdom of your old age before you get there. Isn't that a wonderful idea? To be able to have that information now in your life so you can move through your life to get to that place. So that's the middle world cosmology. So what we find with the drum is that it has a certain beat or a certain tone. And they've recognized in, and when I studied neurofeedback and, and um, biofeedback, what we discovered was that the brain has a frequency following response. And that is, it responds to sound. This is why raves and music of different types bring us into different states of consciousness. When you're listening to classical music, you're in one um, brainwave state, maybe alpha or, or beta. When you listen to more driving music, like the shamanic drum beat, which is four to seven beats per second, um, it brings you into theta, which kind of opens the doorway so that you can access the deeper realms. You know, the drumming journey usually lasts about uh, 20 minutes, a half an hour or longer, depending on how far or deep you want to go. And then when it's time to come back, we give you the callback signal. Whenever we are doing shamanic healing work, it's always very important to open sacred space, to call in the spirit guides, have an altar set up, and so that you're embedding and imbuing the energy into the space. So for example, you know, shamans, you often see them, shamanic practitioners, they start, I like to start in the east. to look at what's around you. You know, literally, you know, look at the branches of a tree and the leaves on it. Watch the insects in the undergrowth. 
Watch how the sun comes up. It's a sense of yourself when you go outside and you're shivering because it's cold and you stop for a moment and you say, oh, this is what it feels like to be alive. It's not about, you know, running away from the rain, for example, but it's standing in that space and this is a beautiful experience. If I really ensoul this moment, I'm in the perfect place in the perfect space. And it doesn't cost you anything. You can't buy soul. No amount of money will, will get you that sense of deep connection to yourself and to the universe. I think in our culture, and what I have been noticing is that the trauma of Western life and the world we live in is often what is initiating people into becoming wounded healers. It's that disassociation, which, which we call in shamanism loss of soul, that trains them for later being able to work in this way. Um, what well, the shamans of the Celtic land of Ireland, Britain and, and into Europe, and they call the soul anima, anima. And we have a term in Ireland called animkar, soul friend. And this is what I would see happening in these groups. People would start pairing off together and become soul friends because they have a sense of connection and sisterhood and brotherhood because they had a shared experience. But the Druids would, would, um, did all their ceremonies and rituals outside in nature. They had Druid groves just like the one we have here. We have the Cairn in the fields where we do our, our meditations and journey. So the Druids looked to the sky, they looked to the earth, they looked to the wind and the rain and the trees particularly, and they saw that everything had soul. And the, 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 the oak was a particularly um, um, important tree, the yew in, in, in other cultures, because again, it embodied that sense of permanence in the sense that, that the oak tree, they say, takes a hundred years growing, it's a hundred years here and it takes a hundred years dying. So this sense of presence here, solidity, because we have a part of a soul called the wild soul that seeks wilderness. We've evolved over tens of thousands of years to become into this industrialized digital age. And it's happened very rapidly in, in, in the last hundred years. So in a sense, you could say that humanity has left part of its soul behind. That desire you have for the shiny object, the latest phone, um, the gadgets, the new car, the, the gold, silver, diamonds. <clears throat> see that longing in you, you see that feeling you have that you want it, you need it, and you have to have it like now or yesterday. If you stop yourself for a moment, and you go inside, and you sit in stillness with yourself and you say, what am I really looking for here? What do I really need? What do I want? Your soul will speak to you then. Now you won't like it for the first little part of it, maybe. Because it's going to remind you of things that you're not thinking about anymore. It's going to remind you of things you'd rather forget, perhaps. It's going to remind you of things you've put aside and locked away because you don't want to really address it. Because you've found that in the short term you can substitute that longing in you for external objects. That eventually lose their luster anyway. They don't do it for you. But you sit with soul and it would say, you know what? You see that feeling you're running away from? That anxiety, <clears throat> that feeling of melancholia, that sense of fear, the anxiousness in you. Give it a voice. Give it a presence. So that's the point I want to make here today, on one level. That it's not just about death itself. It's about the ego death, or dying to ourselves and being reborn. But in terms of the shamanic idea of death and working with death, the shaman uh, is a midwife for the soul. In the sense that in traditional cultures, the shaman would work with the person who is dying and escort their souls from this life into the afterlife, making sure they get across safely. Beautiful work. We make a contract with our guides so, and our ancestors so that they'll be there, present for us at the moment of our death and they'll help escort us over into the afterlife. It's a beautiful thing to do. 
it's, it's, it's something that I've only seen done in shamanism, and this is why I love this practice so much, because from the shamanic point of view, there is no death. There is just transition. We may move from an embodied state of incarnation into the spirit world, where our soul is free, and there's a great beauty in that, a great comfort in that, because when you're not afraid of death, and that's your friend and your ally, you're not afraid to live. Your value systems change because the things that you thought were important to you aren't as important anymore. And here's the other thing it helps me with, and it helps a lot of the students I work with. It helps them let go of loved ones who are dying and who have died. And you know when people are in grief and, and, and they're in that place of absolute loss, they're very open, they're very raw. And the Native Americans would say that those people were blessed by spirit because they were stripped bare to themselves, to the core essence. And in fact, in Native American tradition, people in, in those deep states of grief and loss were seen as having huge spiritual potential. Um, as you know, my point and my perspective on all this is not about believing anything. I don't believe in dogma or dictates. Mm -hmm. That's why I love about shamans is the path of direct revelation. It's spiritual democracy. If you want to know what I'm talking about here today is real or not, go and try it out for yourself. So now we're going to take you on a journey through the calling in the directions, north, south, east and west, the upper world and the lower world. And we're going to do it from a shamanic point of view and a druidic point of view. Thank you.